Good morning, and welcome to PACAR's first quarter 2020 earnings conference call. All lines will be in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. Today's call is being recorded, and if anyone has any objection, they should disconnect at this time. I would now like to introduce Mr. Ken Hastings, PACAR's Director of Investor Relations. Mr. Hastings, please go ahead. Good morning. We would like to welcome those listening by phone and those on the webcast. My name is Ken Hastings, PACAR's Director of Investor Relations, and joining me this morning are Preston Fite, Chief Executive Officer, Harry Skippers, President and Chief Financial Officer, and Michael Barkley, Senior Vice President and Controller. As with prior conference calls, we ask that any members of the media on the line participate in a listen-only mode. Certain information presented today will be forward-looking and involve risks and uncertainties including general economic and competitive conditions that may affect expected results. For additional information, please see our SEC filings and the Investor Relations page of PACAR.com. I would now like to introduce Preston Fight. Well, good morning, everyone. Harry Skippers and I will update you on our first quarter results and our business highlights. I'd like to begin by expressing my sincere thanks and appreciation to all PACAR employees for their dedication, hard work, and their upbeat spirit as we tackle today's challenges and work towards a bright future. The trucking industry has been declared as an essential business. Pack our employees, along with our dealers, are providing critical support to our customers who are delivering medical supplies, food, and essential services to our communities around the world. I also want to express my gratitude and thanks to the millions of men and women who are working hard to support those affected by the pandemic. I'm pleased to share that the PACAR Foundation has donated $2 million to United Way and other organizations to help our communities. Over the next few weeks, we're beginning a gradual resumption of truck production at selected factories. The specific restart timing for each plant and office location is being aligned with government directives, implementation of our work and social distancing measures, parts availability from suppliers, and our business needs. During this gradual restart, our highest priority is on ensuring the health and safety of our employees and their families. Looking at our first quarter financial results, PACAR achieved good revenues and net income. PACAR's first quarter sales and financial services revenues were $5.2 billion, and first quarter net income was $359 million. PACAR delivered 38,400 trucks during the first quarter. PACAR parts achieved quarterly revenues of $999 million. Parts pre-tax profits were a record $215 million, 3% higher than the same period last year. Truck and parts gross margins were 12.3% in the first quarter. The first quarter results included $50 million in higher accruals for product support costs. PACAR Financial achieved pre-tax income of $48 million. DOF, Peterbilt, and Kenworth delivered excellent heavy-duty market share in the first quarter. Kenworth and Peterbilt's U.S. and Canada market share increased to 30.4% compared to 30% for the full year of 2019. DOF's European market share increased to 16.7% in the first quarter compared to 16.2% last year. And in Brazil, in the above 40-ton segment, first quarter DOF market share increased to a record 8.7% compared to 6.1% last year. Fantastic work. PACAR has steadily grown market share over the long term by delivering excellent value to our customers in terms of product quality, innovative technologies, and low total cost of ownership. The global macroeconomic environment is uncertain at this time. Therefore, we will not provide guidance on estimated 2020 truck industry market sizes, next quarter's truck deliveries and gross margins, and pack our parts revenues. Our employees are doing an excellent job managing through the pandemic. We are rigorously aligning costs to the changing market 
conditions, including reducing capital investment and research and development costs. As a result of the company's strong culture and discipline, we have achieved 81 consecutive years of profitability and have a bright future. Terry Skippers will now provide an update on Packard Parts, Packard Financial Services, and other business highlights. Harry? Thanks, Preston. Packard continues to provide strong operating cash flow for reinvestment in future growth and distributions to stockholders. Operating cash flow was $416 million in the first quarter. Packard delivered an excellent return on invested capital of 23% over the last five years due to a combination of strong profitability and a consistent, conservative approach to investing in the business. Yesterday, the PEGA Board of Directors announced a regular quarterly dividend of $0.32 cents per share. PEGA has a strong balance sheet with $4.3 billion of cash and marketable securities, no manufacturing debt, and an A-plus A1 credit rating. PEGA Parts achieved quarterly revenues of $999 million, which is comparable to the same period last year. Parts pre-tax profits were a record $215 million, 3% higher than the first quarter last year. To drive growth, Packer has made consistent investments in parts distribution capacity and customer-focused technologies. Packer Parts will open two new parts distribution centers this year. One is in Ponta Grossa, Brazil, and the other one is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Packer Parts has also made significant investments in its e-commerce platform, which is benefiting our customers and dealers in this challenging time. Packer like Financial Services' first quarter revenues were $384 million, and Fretex income was $48 million, reflecting lower used truck sales results. Kenworth and Peterbilt truck resale values command a 10 to 15% premium over competitive trucks. Packer Financial is investing to increase its retail used truck sampling capacity worldwide, which enhances its used truck sales margins. Packer Financial recently opened a used truck center in Denton, Texas, and plans to open additional used truck in Prague, Czech Republic, and in Madrid, Spain this year. Packer Financial Services has excellent ongoing access to the debt markets, including commercial paper, on a regular basis, issuing commercial paper on a regular basis. During the first quarter, Packard issued three and five-year term notes, totaling $632 million. In addition, in early April, Packard Financial issued a $400 million three-year fixed rate note. We have reduced 2020 capital expenditures by $100 million to a range of 525 to $575 million, and have reduced research and development expenses by $45 million to a range of $265 to $295 million. Like our strong financial position enables us to continue investing in important capital and R&D projects in all market conditions. And finally, we thank our excellent independent Kenworth, Peterbilt, and Dove dealers for their support of our customers. Kenworth, Peterbilt, and Dove dealers are well capitalized and have invested $2.6 billion in their businesses in the last 10 years. These investments continue to make a significant contribution to Packard's truck market share and Packard parts and financial services performance. Thank you. We'd be pleased to answer your questions. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that's star, then one, to ask a question. Your first question today comes from the line of Stephen Volkman of Jeffries. Your line is open. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking the um, Maybe press... Can we go back to your opening comments? I'm curious about a little more detail about how you're thinking about reopening uh, production because you mentioned a number of things there. You mentioned sort of, you know, local regulations. You mentioned 
availability, and, and then you mentioned kind of market demand. Um, so there's sort of three buckets to think about there. But, you know, you know, can you give us any more color of the rate of reopening that you might expect as, as we go forward? Hey, Stephen, good to talk to you. Um, very glad to. I'd tell you that the most important thing as we think about restart is, again, I keep reemphasizing this, is the health of our employees, their families, our concern for getting it right, making sure we take care of them. That's number one, that's number two, and that's number three for us, actually. And then as we look about it, we obviously want to make sure that we have uh, alignment with the government agencies. That's really important to us so that we're staying aligned with best practices for how we can reopen, restart society. It's also important that we think about our supply base and their readiness for the restart of our factories and make sure we stay aligned with them and then, of course, our business needs. So all those things together are where we're thinking about it, and I can really please the best practices that we've put in place in the factories um, as far as temperature taking for our employees, the distancing protocols, separation of the employees with spacing and barriers, and then wearing masks and personal protective equipment and enhanced cleaning. So all those things are going into our approach for reopening the factories. It is going to be a gradual reopening. It's going to be done on a location-by-location basis in a phased manner. We've already started some this week. In fact, we're kind of in the startup of operations in Europe and in Australia. And then we will work through the rest of our plants in the coming weeks and make sure we take care of the employees and bring the truck factories back up and running. So would you expect to have everything back up and if running at some level by the end of the quarter, perhaps? That's a good way to kind of put bookends around that. That's a long window, and that would feel pretty good about that. I mean, we're thinking of sooner, but we obviously don't have the final answers, and we are working through that in a constructive way with the local agencies and supply base. Great. Thanks. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Andy Casey of Wells Fargo Security. Your line is open. Oh, thanks, and good to talk to everybody today. Good to talk to you, too. Um, I guess following on Steve's question, you know, PACAR really has a strong supply chain management track record. You mentioned that. Uh, you know, that's one of the factors. Um, a couple questions, if I may, about that. First, have you encountered any smaller suppliers running into liquidity issues? And then second, um, it seems like, you know, the world may be looking at kind of a piecemeal reopening, uh, you know, in terms of when to ease the current virus containment efforts. How how much of an impact slash challenge could that have or be to get your operations, you know, back up and running? A great question. It's a fun it's a fun thing to, for our teams to be working through right now with our suppliers. We have such good communication with them right now that it's really helpful to know um, so when you can tell the relationships matter because we're paying attention to what, what they're doing and when their restart timings are. And large and small suppliers have been doing a really good job of keeping us informed of their readiness. And they're doing the same things we are. Right? They're trying to take care of their employees. They're trying to make sure they stay in line with the government's and then they're moving forward with restart. And so, so far that's part of the whole puzzle we're putting together and, and getting the truck factories back up. Okay. Um, and then just a question on the uh, on the quarter in the truck segment. You know, the decremental margins were <coughs> somewhere around 25% and 26% revenue drop. It's not, not the highest Packard's ever seen, but it's kind of higher than typical. You mentioned, you know, product accrual was, you know, running high. But, you know, could you give us a little more color on what, what kind of drove the, the margin compression? I mean, obviously some of it is, is the shutdown. Well, I think that, um, as you mentioned, we had the $50 million that we took the opportunity to book for the improvement of our uh, continuous refinement of our engines. Our MX engine was a lot of that. We were doing some software and hardware upgrades on the engine. So that's something that we want to do is make sure that our customers keep having the best experiences they can with our engines. And uh, as far as what the future looks like, we're going to see how the, how the pandemic works its way through the system. 
and that will certainly be something we're all watching closely. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Jerry Rivich of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone, and uh, glad to hear you're, you're, you're all doing well. Good morning. Um, I, I'm wondering if you just give us an update on dealer inventory levels for the present discussion we had uh, last quarter, obviously, a uh, different environment, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, give us an update on uh, the declines in uh, dealer inventory levels in March and uh, anticipated declines from from here and, you know, in, in the conversation around timing of the restart, I'm wondering if that calculus has evolved at all, um, given potentially an opportunity to uh, lean out uh, inventories before um, r ramping up production. Sure, sure. Glad to. So the North American industry has roughly 3.8 months of retail sales and inventory. And PACAR has less than that. We have 3.4 months of retail sales through March for Kenworth and Peterbilt dealers. And of our 3.4 months, roughly half of that is at uh, bodybuilders. So that's being worked on right now. And I'm sorry, inventory is in really good shape right now. Okay. And in terms of um, uh, the parts part of the business, um, can you talk about what the cadence um, has been in April? Obviously, very steady performance in the March quarter. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you'd be able to talk about what kind of trends you've seen um, so far in, in April. One of the things that's, that's interesting and just kind of gives a little help, I hope, is that 75% of all goods are moved by trucks. And so a lot of the trucking companies are really busy right now, and they're moving around the country, taking care of our communities. And as that's happening, those trucks end up consuming parts. And so there was a lot of, of strong activity in March, and we still have activity going on in April. And we'll kind of watch how the quarter develops, but, but we expect our parts team to continue to perform really well. And they have great programs. And one of the things that's been nice to watch is their e-commerce programs and the way they're handling our customers and working directly with customers and dealers to support these critical needs is going really well. Okay. And then uh, in terms of um, uh, the operational discussion uh, and the conversation just had with Andy on um, the, the warranty program. So if we back out the warranty program, you know, decremental margins would have been 20%. Um, is that the sort of run rate that we're comfortable thinking through, or is the level of being shut down for, uh, you know, most of April, if not all of April, does that throw that type of decremental margin math um, off kilter as, as we think about um, what, what this quarter might look like? Yeah, I think that we're um, – your assessment of the impact of the, of the product support fees does match into the margin. But I would say that looking forward and what it's going to be going forward, we're going to watch how the, how the situation develops and when we get our factories running and what the state of the economy is in the second quarter. Okay. And maybe just a clarification on the warranty program. Was that just a one-time over-the-air software update or across the population? Or can you just give us some, um, some context behind what exactly that warranty item was? Well, we had the opportunity to optimize the performance of um, our trucks and engines, mostly on our MX engine for the 2017 to 2019 engines, and so that was hardware and software upgrades. And um, this is cool. We think we got that all covered, and making sure that our customers have optimally performing trucks and engines always part of our game plan. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Tim Fine of Citigroup. Your line is open. Uh, thank you, and good morning. Good morning. Uh, the first question I had was on on lost provisions uh, within the within the Finco, and um, they were certainly higher than I was expecting. Uh, at least the absolute level was not not obviously not directionally, but maybe if you could do comment there in terms of is there a specific region or or uh, you know, customer set that that maybe you'd call out. Um, and I'm just thinking about how, how that potentially looks going forward. Uh, should we, at least shorter term, have a, a more challenging backdrop for, 
for truckers, uh, at least in North America. So maybe just just how to think about, again, lost provisions uh, and what you experienced in the quarter. Yeah, the $50 million increase in, in uh, credit loss provision uh, reflects the, the weak economy. And a weak economy under the, the new CECL accounting standards uh, uh, resulted in a more volatile number. So with that weaker economy, uh, the, the calculation resulted in a $15 million higher uh, credit loss provision. If we look at the finance company, uh, the portfolio is in really good shape. We have a very healthy mix of uh, very good A and B customers. And past dues uh, remain really low, uh, currently less than 1%. So a uh, finance company uh, is in good shape, but the, the weaker economy and the, the accounting standards uh, uh, drive most of that increase in, in credit loss reserves. Okay. Thanks, Harry. Uh, maybe just one last one, uh, Preston. I'm, I'm curious on, from the parts team how um, – I'm not sure how, how closely they, they follow it, but McKay, I, and I know you, you're not talking or you're not giving guidance on – on part sales specifically, but I, I, it kind of jumped out at me. I saw McKay put out a forecast the other day that they expect, and again, this, not to say this aligns with, with PACAR exactly, but uh, I'm talking about a parts demand to be down like 20% in, in the U.S. I'm just curious if you had any comments on that. Well, I, I don't really have any comments on McKay's numbers. I know that, you know, what we're watching is a team that's got great programs and and really strongly positioned to support with not just parts, but knowledge. And they're doing a great job of that. And as I said, talking to a lot of customers and our dealers, there is a lot of activity still going on out there, and, and we'll support at the level it's, it's needed. I got it. Thanks a lot. Here, our next question comes from the line of Ann Dagen of J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, everybody. Morning, Ian. Morning. Uh, on the used equipment values, um, you know, about 28% of your finance book is European, and most of that, I think, is probably guaranteed residuals. So can you talk about uh, the used pricing in the Finco business and what that might manifest itself, how that might manifest itself as we go forward here? Uh, used truck prices uh, in Europe came down a little bit in the, in the first quarter, uh, North America used to put prices was mostly mostly flat. Of course, down compared to where we were a year ago. Uh, Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks and uh, command a 10 to 15 percent premium over our competitor vehicles. So we're in, uh, in really good shape from that perspective. But adding used truck uh, retail centers, uh, opening one in, in uh, Czech Republic uh, this quarter. Uh, just added one in Denton, Texas. Um, the uh, used truck inventories, uh, as far as we can tell, in uh, in Europe are a little bit higher than where they've been, especially for the industry. Uh, Duff's used truck inventory is in relatively good shape if you compare it to where the rest of the inventory, uh, the industry is. Yep. Anything you want to add there? Oh, that's exactly right. I mean, we are we are. We have a lower percentage of the inventory of used trucks in Europe than the industry does, and that puts us in good positions. Uh, but you did call out Europe used prices in Europe being weak, weaker than they were a quarter ago or weaker than they were last they were year. Little, they were a little bit lower than a quarter ago and uh, and lower than, than a year ago, but that's kind of an industry-wide thing. That's industry-wide, yeah. Okay. And then just on production costs, can you give us any kind of direction in terms of the number of deliveries, truck deliveries you had uh, in Q1 and any ideas as you ramp back up what you would expect deliveries to be quarter over quarter? I mean, I know you can't see past the second quarter, but as you ramp, any, any direction at least give us a ballpark for Q1 and then uh, where we might think about Q2 being? Sure, and we can talk a little bit about that in that deliveries, you know, were 38,400 for the three-month period. But as far as what we'll see going forward, like I said, I come back to is our biggest focus right now is making sure that our employees are, are well cared for. And as we watch that and take care of that, then we'll ramp back up our production and we'll align that to the demand, and, and we'll see where that takes us in the second quarter. 
Okay, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you soon, yeah. Your next question comes from the line of David Rassel of Evercore IFI. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Uh, good my morning. question is sort of bigger picture, tr trying to think about this period, the nuances of how this is different or similar than 0809, sort of how you, how, what are the differences, the similarities between how you're handling this period and that period, with, with maybe three things in particular, if you could address at a minimum. You mentioned in your, your prepared remarks 81 consecutive years of profitability. Uh, obviously, back in 09, there were two quarters that were basically around break-even. Just wanted to see if you could address the, the idea of this being year number 82, just if you're willing to, to speak to that. Second, the gross margin declines roughly were kind of, you know, 14 and a half, 15 percent. They dropped down to 8 to 8 and a half in 2009. Just trying to get some sense of magnitude, what's different about the business model, more parts, whatever it may be. And lastly, the special dividend, your balance sheet, the equipment company was still net cash back in 2009, but you still chose to greatly reduce the special dividend year over year. Just wanted to try to weave those three key, uh, key pieces in in answering the question of the differences and similarities of today versus the Great Recession. Sure, David. Good to talk with you. Um, first off, you got to start by thinking that we, we did succeed in 08 and 09, and as we look at the company right now, as we sit here in 2020, we're an even stronger company than we were there. Um, we have $4.3 billion in cash sitting um, on our balance sheet. We have great liquidity. We have great access to liquidity in the market still. That hasn't changed during this time frame. Our parts business has grown over that more than a decade, and it's just a foundational part of our business and does a great job. And we have an experienced leadership team that has been through a lot of cycles, and we know how to manage things, and we know how to control costs, and we have amazing trucks and engines out there. The MX engine is doing a great job, and it's 43% of our build, so that's helpful to us from a parts standpoint. Just the business that we've built is really strong, and it's doing a good job of taking care of our customers, and freight continues to move in this environment. So we feel positive about our future and the products we have on the field and those that we're developing. But could you address those three issues to some degree, just the idea of however you feel, the flex in your costs, how the situation may be, and even just your framework sounds like you do expect, obviously, some uneven, but at least some reopening of the factories in the not too distant future. Can we look at 09 as a guide point that if you were able to stay profitable in that environment, this should be similar? The gross margins getting cut in half roughly a little bit better than that is a framework, and also the handling of the special dividend. If you can just give some parameters of the difference now versus then for those three issues in particular. Well, you, you know, let's just take the last one you mentioned on dividends, and we announced our dividends yesterday for the first quarter at $0.32 cents a share, which is a strong indicator of what we've done. Um, we have a great history of dividends, and we'll look forward to what our future is going to be, and that's a board decision, and we take care of that as we progress through the year based upon the results. Um, I think that I don't think that it, it, it's a fair thing to think of it as an 08, 09 kind of a thing. They're just different. Each situation is unique. And, you know, what we've got is freight being moved. And kind of giving you the kind of the, the truth of the matter is the freight is being moved. Our company is well built. We have a great position in terms of our liquidity, our cash position, our product investments. Our trucks are the best in the world. And that feels pretty good. And the comfort in the larger parts business and a business that's more on your own vertically integrated drivetrain than back then, is that something else that we should take a little more comfort in versus 09? But at the same time, the unevenness of the production, it's you know it's really less of almost your decision that when, when you can ramp up. I mean, is that the yin and yang here? Better about parts, a little more uncertain about the truck margins, just given, in a way, a bit of out of, out of your hands? Sure. We have the, we have the stronger – stronger foundational tr uh, parts market. We have the growth in our engine business, right? The 0809 wasn't here in North America, so that's good. I think the other thing to think about is share growth over that time frame has been significant. So we've had really strong share growth over that time, which contributes extra volume to us. And Packard does a great job. Our team is so good at uh, adjusting the business, both in capital and expense side, to think about how the business should be run. And so we really do adjust to the market conditions all right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. You bet, David.
So our next question comes from the line of Joel Tess of BMO. Your line is open. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, Joel. Good to talk to you. Yeah, nice to hear your voice as well. And and so just to follow up on, on kind of the, the, the thrust of, um, of Ann and David's questioning, you know, does, does your intelligence, like what, what you know and see today and hear, does, does that give you a sense that by the end of the second quarter you'll be able to give us more, uh, a more um, whatever it is, like a clearer view of what the rest of the year looks like and, and how things play out? Yeah, I think that's a, that as a general sense, you know, it seems like um, by the by the next quarter gets through us, we'll have a lot more information than we do today, and and we'll share you share with you uh, what we can at that point. And then I wonder if you could give us a little bit of a sense, you know, like you're kind of hinting at uh, flexibility in the factories, and every time you walk through, you know, there's you know there's fewer and fewer people, or there's more automation, whatever the way, right way to say it is. Can can you give us a sense of some of the internal focus points you guys are kind of using this, you know, this uh, pandemic as an opportunity to come out of this situation stronger over the next five or ten years than, than you were going into it? Well, I think, you know, what, what I look at is first thought, the first thing that comes to my mind is when we go to our factories, when I go to our factories and I meet with our people, whether it's in a distribution center or a truck factory or anywhere, it's just how impressive they are. And we have such an incredible group of people and, and they're just exceptional. They're just exceptional people. I'm so proud of them and what they're doing. So they're the ones that are every day thinking of new ways to optimize our efficiencies and effectivenesses, and they do it every day. And they continue in that vein, and we use Six Sigma as a great tool for ourselves in optimizing, and we'll continue doing that. Um, this is a creative time for us as we look at, at truck production and how we come back, and we'll, we'll learn some new things. and they'll be helpful to improving the business and making us even more effective and efficient as we look forward. Uh, your employees are going to make a make a recording of this and come back to you and ask for a raise uh, next January. Th thank they're you very much. They are the best in the world. They're fantastic. Your next question comes from the line of David Laker of Baird. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I, I, I want to try and dig through a little bit of kind of the segments within the trucking space, um, you know, and, and, and your customers. I mean, there are some parts that are that are strong, you know, consumer focused, package delivery focused. There are some that are really weak, energy and auto related. Can you talk a little bit about that customer mix for you for your products and and how that would compare to the industry? you know, overall in general? Sure. You did a good job of summarizing what's really going on. Is if you look at refrigerated carriers or protein haulers, um, they obviously have just seen a shift in where their business is going. So those long-haul trucking companies that are delivering that are, are doing well. The vocational segment is where we're a market leader, the market leader. And that business has been strong. And I mentioned that, you know, part of our inventory is at bodybuilders right now. So that inventory is being built and being ready for production for a summer season. And I think, you know, as you look at some of the some of the over-the-road trucking companies, it varies by company. Um, talking with some of them, they have a good base of customers, and those that have a good base of customers, they're well, really well positioned. And they're, as you said, the energy sector has been lower, but the yang to that yang is that fuel prices are down 20%. And if fuel prices are one-third of the operating costs for a trucking company, then that's helping them from their operating models as well. So... That's kind of, you, you characterized it well, and that's a little bit more information on it. Okay, great. Th thank you. That's all, that's all I needed. Okay. Our next question comes from the line of Ross Gilardi of Bank of America. Your line is open. Morning, guys. Morning, Ross. Um, I had a qu two questions. First, on, on the PDCs and the, the two additional ones that you're going to add. Um, can you quantify at all how big of a global increase in, you know, parts footprint that this will represent when you when you open them? And do you worry at all about adding parts distribution capacity in the middle of a recession? Um, 
and I, I'm trying to just get at like how many you guys have you guys have added a, a lot of distribution centers over the last five to ten years, and you know, granted that that market's not going to move like you know be as volatile as, as the overall truck cycle, but if we're in a slower economy for a longer period of time, do you bump up into a limit at some point as to how much you can continue to ex- expand that, that distribution uh, network? Sure. You know, we have 18 distribution centers. We'll be adding two more. I was down in the Las Vegas facility a couple of weeks ago, a new one. It's just beautiful. And I know the employees are excited to move in there because we were talking about it. I think one of the things that's happening is there's there's always opportunity to gain share, and we continue to use those distribution centers and the best practices around them to gain share. For example, if our distribution centers are more closely aligned to our dealer body, then we're able to deliver more overnight parts to our customers and keep their uptime at maximum levels, which is one of our key objectives. And that gives us a competitive advantage against the market. So that's part of the thinking. It's not just about parts and storing them. It's about getting them to the customers as quickly as possible, and that's going been really successful for us in helping the parts team grow the business. Okay, so is, is it fair, you know, are, are they all fairly similar in size? If you're adding two on a, on a you know, a network of 18, is, is this sort of like a, a, a 10% increase? And will the business benefit from just some type of pipeline fill in the, in the I don't know if that would be a second quarter event or a, a second half event? that will help continue to support the top line for, you know, for the parts business this year. Sure, you're right in saying it will continue to support the top line growth for the business. Um, and, yeah, roughly 10%. There is some variance in the size of the PDCs, but they're roughly the right order, same orders of magnitude. Okay, gotcha. And then just, just lastly, can, can you quantify your energy exposure? I realize it's, it's, it's tricky, but maybe at the very least you could, you could um, tell us what portion of your U.S. and Canadian dealer network is you know, located in the, the Gulf region or other energy-dependent regions, and anything like that would be really useful. Yeah, we have a very diversified portfolio. Um, it's, it's not concentrated overly in the energy sector. So, you know, the dealers that have – there are some dealers that obviously have more exposure, um, but our dealers are doing just such a great job of building their businesses – that they have good absorption, good parts and service businesses throughout, diversified customer bases, even for themselves. And so dealer body's in really good shape and managing that well. Okay, thanks. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Jamie Cook of Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hi, uh, good morning, and I'm glad everyone is uh, healthy and uh, okay in this environment. I guess just, um, you know, two questions. One, can you just talk to, like, on the truck side in, in, in Europe and in, in the U.S., like, what you're hearing from your customers in terms of, you know, trends in April and understanding you don't want to give an industry forecast, but what your customers are sort of telling you how they're thinking about the year, because that would imply you're probably managing your business for that you know, uh, for, for, for whatever they're telling you. And then I guess just my second question, um, understanding you're taking uh, initiatives to cut R&D and CapEx, but how do you think sort of the coronavirus impacts people's, you know, view around, you know, alternative uh, technologies like EV or fuel cell relative to diesel, in particular with diesel prices lower now, perhaps we focus more on economics. Um, so if you could help give color on that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good to talk to you, Jamie. Um, I'd say from a customer standpoint, we do talk to a lot of our customers and the dealers and keep track of what's going on. And, and there is, as we said before, some sec- segments are doing well and some are experiencing moderate slowdowns, and that's to be expected in a situation with this much dynamic um, factoring going into it. But we have a good customer base, and they and they do a good job managing their business. So they're making the adjustments, and there's some trucks that are, not as fully utilized, that's true, but, you know, I'm pretty impressed with how they how they talk about their business and their customer base, and, and again, they're an essential part of our economy, and they will continue to move freight and are continuing to move freight, so that's pretty important to keep perspective on. From a tech standpoint and an R&D and CapEx alignment to that, you know, when I look at that, I'd say we have some really neat programs going on, and um, we're continuing on, on some of the exciting programs that we have within our portfolios, 
and some of those are R&D related. So whether that's battery electric vehicles or work that we're doing, um, that work's going to continue. We're going to keep moving along on doing the critical things that are going to build a bright future for our company and provide our customers the, the lowest operating costs possible. So kind of a bit of a look at what's going on. Okay, thank you. you I appreciate the caller. Here, our next question comes from the line of Stephen Fisher of UBS. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Stephen. I just, uh, you guys called out some nice market share gains across the regions. What does your order share in backlog tell you about what your market share of, of retail and production might be over the next few quarters, and are there any regional differences? Well, yeah, I think we have seen good market share gains. We mentioned the 30.4% in the U.S. and 16.7% in Europe and really strong 8.7% in Brazil. And in the medium duty side, also good growth in both Europe and North America. So that's been good. And as far as what order intake has been, I think in the last month we have numbers for we had was March, and we had 38% of the order intake in the month of March. Um, we're in a good position. Yeah, some, some okay. Color, more color on Europe. I think the um, market share growth uh, to 16.7% for Dove has been in, in most markets, uh, especially the UK. In the UK, our share of the first quarter has uh, grown to 35%. So uh, we're really benefiting from the fact that we, we have a, an excellent factory in, in Leyland and are able to build our trucks for the UK in the UK. Okay, and then you have some plans to open up some international used truck centers. How much better do you expect the used margins to be at these company-owned retail centers versus any other used sales channels that are out there? Oh, the, uh, those used truck centers, one of the benefits that we have is that they uh, predominantly sell to, to retail customers. And uh, the, the margins we make when we sell a used truck to a retail customer are significantly higher than uh, selling them to wholesalers or, or other customers. So those used truck centers uh, really give us a very nice return on our investment there. Okay. Thanks very much. Set. Your next question comes from the line of Seth Weber of RBC Capital Market. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Hope you're well. Good morning. Um, actually, I wanted to follow up on Steve's uh, Steve's last question. Is the, on the um, uh, the used sales mix. Is there any color you can provide on sort of where you see the the channel mix, uh, where it's today, where you think it's going, you know, as far as retail versus uh, wholesale and auction, anything that we can kind of use to frame what the opportunity there is to to get the margins up. Yeah, what I look at is you know. The Packer Financial team has done a really good job of building this used truck center uh, network, and we've seen even in the U.S. Uh, an uptick in the in the recent time of more retail activity flowing through the used truck centers. And as we build like the one in Prague and expand our capabilities, that just creates a an outlet for the strong customer demand for Packer products in the used market, and it gives them a good place to go to get a young truck that's going to serve their needs really well, and and they're happy to to buy those trucks from us because they know what they're getting. That helps values. Right. Uh, okay. And then, um, sorry if I missed this, I, um, but have you addressed, have you talked to uh, just the, the new truck pricing environment? I think I think last quarter you, you said it was up about 2%. Uh, I'm just wondering if anything has changed, you know, given the, uh, given the, the, the macro and also the weakness in, in used pricing. Are you, if anybody, if any of your competitors are, you know, doing anything irrational, or is that you still seeing positive pricing new tr on the new truck side? Thanks. Yeah, well, um, we'll let you talk to the competitors and what they do that's irrational. But for us, what we see is we've been steadiness in pricing, and uh, I think there continues to be a strong desire to have the best trucks, which are Kenworth, Peterbilt, and Doff. Okay, uh, fair enough. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. All right.
Your next question comes from the line of Courtney Yakovelkonis. You're from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Good morning, guys. Good to talk to you. Um, I was wondering if you could just share with us a little bit more detail on how to think about, you know, some of the fixed costs associated with um, the plant shutdowns and then also with the plant reopenings um, and if any of the protocols that you're enacting that could last for a bit longer uh, might, um, might, you know, impact the, the cost basis, you know, over the next 12 to 18 months. Thanks. Sure. As far as um, the protocols we're implementing, you know, come back to the, to the statement because it's core to us is our biggest focus right now is making sure that our employees are cared for and operate in a healthy and safe environment. And so those protocols, things like temperature testing when they enter the facilities and making sure there's six feet between them or 1.5 meters in Europe, that we have put up um, spacing and, and barriers where we're building the trucks, that people are wearing masks, that we're doing great cleaning, and that we're comparing all of our practices that I just described to other industry leaders to make sure we have the best practices in, in place. Those will, those will carry on as long as they need to to make sure that our employees are, are, are healthy and protected and they're involved in the process and want them to feel comfortable with their environments, and that's really important to us. And then as far as the costs um, that we experience, right, we're, we're a company that's always thinking about capital costs and expense costs and looking for ways to, to reduce them, and our teams are fully focused on that. Looking, That's why you see the reduction in the CapEx spending plans that, that we outlined in our opening comments and why we are looking at R&D reductions that we can take just so that the business is optimized and set up for this set up for this uh, industry cycle. Is there anything you could share with us just maybe about, you know, factory overhead costs that might not be getting cut just for the weeks um, that, that you're shut down? And then, you know, if there's any difference between the shutdowns in, in North America versus in Europe? Yeah, there, there, the difference is, is that, you know, we have furloughs from employees during the during the stopping point, and that's um, been what we've done in North America and Europe. In the Netherlands, the, we have a good relationship with our unions there, with our employees there, and with the government there, and they've um, been able to help us support people still working during the shutdown on the overhead side of the business, and that's great because we're continuing to make progress in these practices to keep a healthy and safe environment. And even on the engineering side, they're continuing to work on new projects and processes that are aligned with government support programs. And those support programs are in place not only in the Netherlands, but also in Belgium and the UK. And PECAR qualifies for all those programs. And then just lastly, you know, your parts um, margins did, you know, hold up very well uh, this quarter. Um, you mentioned, you know, that you've been building out the e-commerce platform, but are you seeing any, you know, structural changes that you think might last, you know, in terms of how um, your customers are interacting with that business in this environment? I think that I think that well, because this may hasten the move towards more and more e-commerce in the parts business. Um, but our, and our team has built a great system to make that available for the customers and for the dealers to work with. And we continue to use e-commerce and the MDI systems to, to help everybody have the right parts in the right places at the right time so that we can make sure our customers' uptime is, is optimized. And there may be a little bit of a move towards that furthering, and that's good for PACCAR and good for our parts team. Great, thanks. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Elcott of Cohen. Your line is open. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, so the truckload industry, which is an important part of your uh, customer base, had been dealing with um, some headwinds like rising insurance premiums and low freight rates, uh, which was resulting in a lot of market exits. Uh, but now they also have the tailwind of lower diesel prices. So my question is, if we start to see an economic rebound while at the same time oil prices lag and remain relatively low, uh, which would be good for the health of the truckload industry, do you have any sense of how quickly that could translate into, into higher orders and, and how quickly you could see a benefit from that? That's, that's a good commentary you offered. I think it's a it's a truth of the confluence of of the pandemic and the low oil prices and the fact that customers continue our customers trucking companies continue to deliver freight and when they're delivering freight they're putting miles on trucks and so that bodes well for us in the future because um, they're consumable and 
over time we'll need to replace them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that makes sense. And then just one uh, one uh, follow up uh, on the balance sheet side. Uh, you don't have manufacturing debt, but uh, you do uh, obviously go to uh, debt markets for in your uh, financial services segment. Um, if if this economic crisis intensifies and and uh, you know morphs into a financial crisis, do you think you may have to borrow on your manufacturing uh, segment for your financial services segment? So you're, you're right. Tekra has a very strong balance sheet with uh, $4.3 billion in cash, a strong A plus A1 credit rating, and no manufacturing debt. And, and that is exactly how we like it. And we've had good access to the markets. We do. We have great credit ratings and good access to the markets, and, you know, we've had no trouble in getting midterm notes, and our issuances in the first quarter were $632 million, and uh, we did an issuance in April for $400 million, and, we have really good positions to support our financial services business. Great. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Felix Motion of Raymond Jane. Your line is open. Hey, morning. Thanks for the time, everybody. Um, I really just have a quick question around how to think about the parts business going forward. I think obviously trucks still moving is a positive for the business, but outside of looking at industry truck utilization, was there anything we should think about around the strong 1Q performance in that business, dealers building parts inventory given some uncertainty ahead, or any color on where you think inventory levels might be today? Sure. I think that the most significant factor is the team at Packard Parts has done a great job with our, along with, alongside of our dealers of having the right kind of systems in place to support the customers, and so they become a go-to organization in these times. And they're doing a great job of meeting the demand there. And I think that they're obviously as the situation is dynamic, people were looking at that and said, well, you know, they want to make sure they have parts on the shelf to take care of the customers, and they've done that. And as we move forward, they're consuming those parts, and they'll reorder. Thank you. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Fahim Shibia of Longbow Research. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, just for starters, as far as the social distancing and the staggered shifts that you guys are employing in the factories, uh, would that have any impact on production capacity? Um, excuse me, what was the last part? Uh, would that have any impact on production capacity? Yeah, I think that we always we, – we think that in the market we're in, we have sufficient capacity – and even bringing in these great best practices, we'll have uh, sufficient capacity to build for our customers' needs. Okay. And can, can you provide some color around the order intake and cancellations that you've been seeing so far, at least through April? I just want to understand if your backlog is, is essentially holding or shrinking at this point. Yeah, I think that through the month of April, our backlog actually improved and increased because we weren't building trucks. And so we do have good backlog through the, through the second quarter. And we'll watch how that carries on. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Rob Wertheimer of Milius Research. Your line is open. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, my question is just on your visibility into any future supply chain disruption from all the obvious, you know, impacts. Uh, does that feel like a major uncertainty still, or, you know, is your visibility in the supply chain and how your suppliers are working, you know, seem less volatile, you know, and less of a, a disruptive risk? Thanks. You bet. Uh, we're working really close with all suppliers. We have daily contact with them, and we have a great, strong supply base, and we choose them for their strength. and um, continue just alignment with them so that when we restart, they're ready to go in alignment with us being ready to go. So they're daily conversations. There's nothing that seems, you know, unstable right now. It's just making sure they put the best practices in, care for their people, which they want to do, and align up with the government directives. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And you've made a number of helpful comments on parts. Are you able to, to say from telematics or otherwise – you know, how far miles driven are down in April, you know, just to give a sense of real-time pulse of the economy? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. We we do have 
in North America, all of our trucks are connected, so the people in Kenworth trucks are connected, and we watch vehicle miles traveled, and we watch um, utilization of the fleet. And while it's down just a little bit, it's it's also holding up pretty well and remains at high levels over the historical um, framework. Uh, okay, thank you. Good. Your next question comes from the line of Joe O'Day of Vertical Research. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, with respect to the facility restart, um, and you talked about deploying safety protocols and government regulations and, and supply chain, can you talk about um, it, any government regulations today that prevent you from operating, um, and are there protocols that you have not yet deployed um, or, or are sort of facilities ready to operate and regulations aren't restricting you, and it's just about sort of comfort level with supply chain? Well, we continue to work in alignment with the initial um, declarations, which is that trucking is an essential business and the part supply is an essential business. So that's one of the things we work with. And then the other is to make sure that these best practices we put in for our employees um, are sufficient and are robust and protect them well. And those two things in alignment are, are what define our restart strategy. And so you're still rolling out some of those safety protocol actions at facilities? Indeed, we are, and staying lined up with each state and their directives as well. Got it. Okay. Thanks very much. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Rob Salmon of Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys, and thanks for taking our questions. Um, I, I guess kind of piggybacking on uh, the adjustments you guys have made to to the factories um, to obviously protect the employees and, and respect social distancing, is there any um, cost quantification that you can kind of help us think about, whether it's the impact to gross margins or, or kind of incremental cost per piece associated with the cleaning, with, with the temperature taking, um, as well as spacing out employees a, a little bit more than we would historically have seen? No, there's, there's nothing that's that concrete or, you know, we take the temperatures of the employees we're going to as they, as they come back into the factories pre-production, make sure everybody's healthy when they come to work. That's good for everybody. And then the teams are doing a really good job of just bringing in um, safety protocols that work with truck production, and that overlay has, has gone very well in our factories where we're starting up. And like Preston has said, the number one priority is the safety of our employees, and there might be some costs associated with that, but that's not the number one priority. No, of course, you guys made that very clear, um, and, and, and we'll kind of keep that in mind. As we're looking forward, um, or as we look through kind of the first quarter, can you give us a sense of what the parts revenue cadence was by month? Like, did we see any sort of major difference in, in your parts revenue in the month of March relative to, to January, February? It was relatively flat through the quarter. I mean, there were weeks and differences by weeks, but it was relatively flat through the through the first three for each of the months. Uh, that, that's helpful. And, and then on the, the provisions for, for, lo uh, for losses on receivables, uh, with the step up that we saw obviously kind of tied to the economy, were you seeing any difference in terms of the, the receivables that you have for, for the customers relative to dealers in, in kind of one of those two channels? Was there was there a big customer impact? I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, bet, better understand as, as we think about the impact looking forward. No, I, 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 we, we talked about the uh, past dues being really low. And uh, most customers are in a good position to pay their bills on time. Uh, finance company is doing well. We're financing a, a stable portion of our, the trucks that we sell. And um, with all good, good, uh, well-rated customers that, that pay their bills. Appreciate the time, guys. Yeah, you bet. Have a good day. Your next question comes from the line of Jeff Kaufman of Loop Capital Management. Your line is open. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking my question. Um, sure. I, I guess uh, two quick questions. Um, 
Number one, following up on what Jamie was asking earlier, the is this more a deferral on CapEx and R&D or uh, more of a structural adjustment where maybe we're not going to do certain things? And, um, you know, where do you think in terms of, I think Jamie was hinting, is the EV movement slowing down because low fuel prices and, and pushing things out? But in terms of looking at R&D programs or capital spending, where is the flex and kind of what do you think should be pushed out in this kind of environment? Okay. Happy to answer that question with you. So I would say that is whether defer or cancel, we we have a great portfolio of projects. Uh, they all have good returns and provide values to our customers. And so with those projects, um, often what we're looking at right now is can we do a phase now? Can we postpone a phase to a later point? Um, very few that will cancel. We just look at how, they, how well they can be done and, how to become more efficient at doing them. And as that lies into the EV movement or autonomous vehicles or connected vehicles, those technologies are continue to be progressing into the truck industry in the coming years, and Packard is going to continue to be a leader in offering EV vehicles to our customers and developing autonomous vehicles, and leveraging partnerships and working with our suppliers and doing in-house development so that we can have all of those ready when our customers want them, and we will – We'll continue to have that leadership position. Okay. That answers both questions. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. And there are no further questions in queue at this time. Are there any additional remarks from the company? Yeah, I guess I'd just like to close by saying thank you to everyone for the calls and, again, just to recognize the outstanding people in our company that are doing such a fantastic job and then also to recognize those people that are handling and managing and working with the COVID situation around the world, and our our heartfelt thoughts and prayers are with them, and we're all going to come through this stronger in the final analysis. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes Packard's earnings call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.